Good morning and uh, congratulations to those of you who've made it to Thursday morning at Davos and uh, are here with us in the room and online. My name is Hiba Ali. I'm the CEO of a news organization that reports about conflicts and disasters around the world called The New Humanitarian. And as you might imagine, uh, refugee flows is a big part of uh, our reporting. And um, today we're going to talk about integrating refugees into labor markets. Of course, this is a moment uh, of rethink on so many things, and asylum policy and integration of refugees is, is one of them, particularly in Europe, but also beyond, as we'll hear about today. Um, having a job is key to uh, not only economic, but also social integration for refugees. And in this moment in which we're seeing so many millions of people um, in Ukraine, but of course beyond as well, um, moving uh, we're also seeing that in many cases that integration is, is halted because of a lack of access to the ma labor market. Um, the hypothesis is that Ukraine is beginning to change that and has opened up a conversation around how better to support refugees, um, including in how they access uh, employment. And so today we're going to try to showcase some examples of the private sector um, in succeeding in, in doing that, but also some of the barriers in being able to, to scale that kind of agenda up, and then explore um, some opportunities for uh, multi-stakeholder action on this, and, and hear um, a few announcements. So um, we've got with us today to my left, uh, Nicholas Schmidt, Commissioner for Jobs and Social Rights at the European Commission. Um, next to him, uh, Valérie Beaulieu, who is the Chief Sales and Marketing Officer at the HR Solutions Company, ADECO. And then um, Jesper Broden, the CEO of the Inca Group, popularly known as IKEA. And finally, Ebru Ozdemir, who is the Chairperson of the Board of uh, Limac Holding, uh, a Turkish conglomerate with companies across a range of industries from uh, construction to tourism to food. So actually, Ebru, I'd like to start with you because uh, you have tried to really raise awareness about um, how refugees can be a benefit to both business and society um, and have supported many projects to upskill uh, refugees, to work with <coughs> refugee-led companies. Um, how did you get to that place? And what's your um, persuasion, I suppose, to your peers in the private sector around the business case for integrating refugees into the labor market? Thank you. It's very nice to be here and discussing about this here today. You know, we see this as if uh, the refugees are not a burden but an opportunity. And in all my talks, I say that refugees have the untapped human capital. It's very important. So seeing in Turkey above 4 million refugees right now and probably around 1 million babies born since the conflict, we thought that we have to integrate it in a, in a way. And currently, they have access, the refugees in Turkey have an access to schools, to the health systems without paying. But at the end of the day, we have to integrate them into the work as well to be, for this to be sustainable. So in, where, in the areas that we work, we do a lot of technical stuff like building bridges, highways, and so forth, or the dams. So it's very hard for us to integrate them in these technical fields because of the technical skills and the languages. However, what we try to do is we brought them on, on board by using them as subcontractors in many like food supplies or some other services that they can give us through, through Turkey. And we also would like to <coughs> create some role models. With Atlantic Council, a couple of years ago, we provided a report on showing what the refugee situation and what's current situation in Turkey. And afterwards, we realized that there are very courageous women in Turkey who came <laughs> with their luggages uh, to Turkey and then started business from scratch. So we decided to make a documentary, Do Seagulls Migrate? And these four women are enormous. I mean, one of them become a journalist. The other one is like a cook. The third one is a, a he sh she established a language school because language in many sectors is a big barrier, I mean. So they have to speak Turkish. And then the, the fourth one is become like a wedding planner and an organizer of weddings and ceremonies. So. Showing this around Turkey, we wanted to create role models. And we also run another uh, program called Turkish Women Engineers. We had, three, we had three Syrian engineers in that, and they all become very good engineers now going to the masters, working at the same time. And one of them already migrated to Germany, so we lost her. So basically, we tried to create role models because from the women's perspective, people can, and from the re refugee perspective as well, they can be what they can see. So this is a lot of work that we do on that side. 
Ebru just mentioned that even for someone who's <clears throat> such an advocate of um, integrating refugees into the labor market, it's been difficult for Lumac to do so because of the technical skills. Um, that's one of several barriers. And Valeria, I wanted to turn to you. Uh, in 2017, ADECO published a white paper that tried to really um, understand and then communicate those barriers to integrating refugees into the labor market. Walk us through more broadly in the sector what you're seeing as blockages. Yeah, and we have a long tradition in the ADECO group of uh, being committed to uh, help refugees. That is core to our values and who we are. And what we've realized and observed is that it's always the same barriers. The, the first, I would say, is the admi administrative bur uh, burden and the regulatory to make sure that people can work uh, in a legally fashion. And I want to salute the work that the European committee, um, community has done uh, in the Ukrainian crisis to make it super easy and extremely fast. So uh, thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. The, the other barrier, as you've just mentioned, is language. We, we have uh, seen situation very recently with uh, Ukrainian uh, refugees where they were hosted in families and they could not even communicate with the families because they, they don't even have English together. Some 85% mm. uh, of the refugees we've observed, uh, in, uh, in, especially in Poland and in the other countries from Ukraine, are women, and many haven't traveled before. So language definitely is a big barrier. The third barrier that we've seen is the fact that their qualification, when they have, are not recognized in the home country. So you have a number of areas where, especially when you have technical qualification, you don't have equivalent. And so that's another barrier. Um, and then last but not least, housing. Uh, you, you, you think about if you want to have a livelihood and to have a job, you need to have an address and you need to have housing. So I would say, if I summarize what we've observed in all the efforts that we've put forward to uh, include um, refugees in the labor force, that would be the fourth, the four. Mm -hmm. I would add just another one that I think we discussed while we were preparing, which is when comes the time of the, for the enterprise to integrate refugees, is to make sure that you are particularly listening to their story and inclusive in their specific situation. They come with a very specific background. They don't any kind of employees. And I think having that uh, uh, proactive and deliberate inclusion towards refugees is also a condition to make it successful to integrate them. So that's one tip. Uh, your white paper also talked about mm -hmm. other tips or recommendations for employers. What would you advise them to overcome some of these barriers? Well, I think this listening um, that I was talking about is absolutely critical and also do not try to do that by yourself. Um, that's also a big learning that we've had. Um, obviously, our core business being in the HR solution, um, for example, in the Ukrainian crisis, we were able in a matter of days to set up a platform uh, that we call Jobs for Ukraine, where we invited uh, companies. We have over 1,500 companies from the private sectors offering jobs uh, to, um, to refugees. And we also closely work with NGO to make sure they would be the go-between to the refugees so that they can participate into that platform. So I think the, the other thing is go to your core business. Don't try to do something that you don't know how to do. And we had one of, the, um, of our clients, we, I was doing call downs to just get people to, uh, to participate to the platform. And, and some of the clients, a big uh, FMCG customer and the consumer good customer was like, I want to help more, what can I do? And I said, well, do you have a warehouse uh, in Poland close to the border? They said, yes. OK, so can you give us some space so that we can store some of the donation? And this, absolutely. Uh, and this is how you can participate. Don't try to invent yourself what you are not. It will be more authentic and you will have more impact. Um, Jesper, I want to come to you. Inca is uh, one of the most engaged companies uh, when it comes to refugee action. And in 2019, you committed to supporting 2,500 refugees by the end of 2023. Um, in all income markets. So mm. tell us what you've been able to do so far um, on that commitment and, and mm. how you've overcome some of the barriers that Valérie has just mentioned. I think, first of all, I, I, uh, you, I think you nailed the barriers and it's a very concrete uh, topic in many ways when you get into it. So the, the background for, for me and for us is that we are a foundation, foundation-based uh, organization. And together with the business and the foundation share the vision to create better life for people. Um, and in that, our foundation has been active since many, many years in supporting the first stage of uh, refugee crisis in many places in the world. Um, the starting point for where we are today was actually in the uh, war in Syria a few years ago, where after the first stage, we were invited by the foundation and the Hashemites in, in Jordan 
to look into how can we actually provide people with dignity, income, uh, purpose in the next stage of life uh, by providing jobs. So I was personally engaged in that and we managed to set up um, um, a social entrepreneurship with textile design and production for 400 women. And it was difficult. We learned uh, everything about uh, the challenges, uh, but we overcome them. Um, and we decided at that time to actually bring what we call today skills for employment as a program uh, to all our markets uh, in, in IKEA. And um, the point for us is the big why, it's, it's, uh, it sits quite deep with us. It's two things that are incredibly important. Uh, maybe the second one is what I will try to drum uh, loud on uh, the coming uh, uh, weeks and months. First of all, uh, maybe not everybody agrees, but we think we need to represent society as it is. Uh, however, the situation, we need to be part of it and be relevant for people. Secondly, this is exactly what Valerie is talking about, and, and you, uh, Ebru. This is a great opportunity. We, we talk about talent being one of the greatest uh, shortages and issues right now. So why wouldn't you see this as a great opportunity? We see uh, great progress with the employment schemes that we have. We actually also see, we have statistics on how actually the retention rates are much better even. And the barriers are about language. Uh, it's um, a couple of things you need to address uh, in a systematic approach. But it's definitely something that is uh, possible and we show that with the numbers. Commissioner, uh, Valérie mentioned that you need other stakeholders involved to do this work, civil society to connect to the refugees, but also the regulatory environment. Um, and uh, the EU is a very uh, special case study of that. <laughs> um, you've responded very swiftly to Ukrainian refugees by, um, well, actually, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you've put in place, um, in, in this case in particular, to make it easier for them to access the labor market? Well, first, <clears throat> thank you very much for organizing this uh, very important discussion. And I, I must say I like very much the comments which have been made which uh, reflects, by the way, the, the general attitude of uh, uh, Europeans and also uh, uh, neighbors uh, towards uh, uh, refugees now during this crisis. I have to admit this was not the case during the previous crisis, except Turkey, I must say, where things, because you referred to this crisis yes. more than, uh, to the former crisis yes, more than. exactly. Then. So I think this is, uh, I, don't know, I do not know is it lessons learned or is it just because uh, first things happened extremely rapidly. Uh, in, uh, in three weeks, uh, uh, more than five million people came into the EU. This is much more than the refugees from Syria because it took nearly two years for three million. So we, there was really uh, a, a very abrupt uh, uh, situation in that uh, in that uh, context, and uh, the reaction was in that way also quite different, because we managed to activate this temporary protection directive, which uh, had been adopted during the uh, uh, wars on the Bal Balkans, but never been activated. Even then, it was not activated, and so the Commission proposed to activate it, and there was an agreement, there was a consensus to do so. And this directive is a very, I would say, progressive one in that sense and reflects exactly what has been said here. Uh, it gives first uh, an immediate status to people, not long demands, not bureaucratic, because very often for refugees, this kind of bureaucratic uh, barriers are extremely uh, difficult and also in some way uh, discouraging, at least. That's a very moderate expression. So this is, uh, makes things much easier. It was also the right way because uh, especially those countries on the borders, Poland, Romania, uh, had to receive each day thousands and thousands of people coming, crossing the border. So this was managed quite well, I must say. I was on the border. I was in Poland. Uh, I, I saw how the Pole managed this also in terms of protecting people because, as you said, uh, those who, who are coming or who, who have come are mainly women mm. and children. So they have special, special needs also for personal protection. 
uh, because we know that, uh, well, there are always also some threats or abuses around uh, such a situation. And uh, the second thing is uh, people should get immediate access to labor market, and this was granted by nearly all the member states. We make efforts to integrate them into the labor market, and also there's a strong will of these refugees to be integrated in the labor market, and thousands have already uh, uh, managed to be uh, in the labor market, mm. which is remarkable also. And uh, especially also access to social services, and I, I fully agree there's one big issue, that's housing. Yeah. That's a real big issue. Now, in the first, st in the first stage, uh, I'm, I'm, I must say that, uh, especially in Poland, but also in Romania, where where the bulk of people have arrived, uh, civil society or just citizens have done a fantastic work. Because uh, not only there, but in Germany, in Sweden also, but where, where really the, the, the millions of people have arrived, they have just received people at home. And this is also something quite exceptional. So there is a, a movement of solidarity in that context. But I think it is supported also by this very open approach, thanks to this uh, frame, the protection directive, and uh, now certainly we have to work on uh, how we really uh, give people, because many of these refugees thought they could come for some weeks or perhaps two or three months and then return back. Some have already turned back, returned back because of the situation in Kiev, uh, which has improved, but uh, the situation, as we all know, in, in, in Ukraine remains extremely, uh, extremely dangerous and, 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 and complicated. So I think now we have to provide these people with the, also the essential social services. I must say, um, last point is education for ch kids. We have more than one million, I think, largely more than one million kids arriving, many s small children and uh, they have uh, interrupted their schooling, everything. So I saw uh, in Poland, I saw also in Romania, mm. how uh, schooling for these kids was in a very rapid way mm. put, uh, put up, mm -hmm. where kids get now, uh, uh, continue their schooling, partially through online schooling, partially with uh, teachers uh, who have arrived also, especially women, women teachers, and uh, I think this is important, first, not uh, to allow these kids to continue their normal life, if one can say so, but also to overcome this kind of trauma these kids have gone through. And I think in that sense, uh, this is an essential element which you ma mentioned also to help people to overcome the trauma uh, they, have, uh, they have been uh, uh, affected by. But it also speaks to the, what Valeri mentioned, that kind of whole of society approach that's needed because the parents can't mm. access the labor market if they don't have yeah, their that's kids in the school. Child care, child care is an issue. Uh, when mm. suddenly uh, uh, the poles have got a second generation of young uh, kids, uh, so you have to build, uh, you have to set up schools for these kids because nearly uh, as many kids as uh, as there were there have arrived from one moment to another, and then child care, uh, which is another challenge uh, to give. In order to allow mothers to work, well, you have to provide the child care, and, uh, and, and, and this, is a, this is a real challenge. But I noticed that a lot has been uh, uh, at least initiated to do so. Uh, well, with the support of uh, the European Union, because we all know this is also a financial uh, challenge for, for the, mm -hmm. the countries who have been faced, uh, who are facing uh, this, uh, yeah. this situation. Yes, sir, yes. I just wanted to, to build on and, and take the opportunity to thank the Commissioner because the speed of policy shifts and enablement was uh, incredible. I was like yourself in, in the border um, in, in Poland to Ukraine uh, among the first weeks. And what I found remarkable was how the whole society, as you said, was basically kids, uh, youngsters stopped school to become volunteers. Uh, uh, I think majority of IKEA co-workers had people in their homes. Um, Mm. The, the centers that I visited had flowers. Um, and I was walking with a, an, a gentleman from the, uh, uh, from the city of Lublin, and he told me the story that in the past, to become a hero in Lublin, in the past history, you either killed your neighbors or you got killed by your neighbors. And now he said, now we're going to try to love our neighbors. And I must say, having been in these uh, places, you can see that the, 
devastation and tragedy we read about in the newspaper. Uh, I would like just to add the goodness of uh, people mobilizing is just amazing to see and to be part of. Now, we've seen that kind of solidarity in the case of Ukraine, and we've seen uncharacteristically fast action by the EU in the case of Ukraine. Um, but more broadly, that hasn't been the case. And um, I, I heard um, your fellow commissioner, um, Margarita Skinas, who uh, is focused on promoting the European way of life, of course. And he, uh, earlier this week, said how frustrated he was at how slow the EU has been to agree a broader migration policy. Um, I think his exact words were, it's, it's too much talk, I'm losing patience. So um, that's, uh, I think, a, a question. And, and if you see more broadly some of the um, frameworks that the EU had tried to put in place before Ukraine, um, and I'm thinking here of the uh, reception conditions directive, which required signatory member states to allow asylum seekers to access um, the labor market within nine months. We saw that the UK, when it was a member, wasn't following that, that Hungary and others weren't really coming mm. along. So um, to what extent is Ukraine likely to lead to the same kind of treatment for other refugees moving forward? Is it a turning point in the way the EU might then um, facilitate what it did for Ukrainians, um, for others? That's for you, Commissioner. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess. <laughs> Well, uh, I, I think there's, there are a certain number of lessons which uh, we should draw from this case, and member states should draw. Uh, first, access to labor markets. I think uh, some countries, by the way, Sweden is one example, access to labor market is quite easy and quite immediate. So you, you do not need, uh, you need not wait uh, nine months, six months until you can be integrated in the labor market. And I think this is something, I, I was migration minister some years ago, and I always uh, pleaded for integrating people immediately mm. into the labor market. Mm. And I heard always this theory, no, that's a pull factor, you should not do that, because this is, uh, if people have to return back and they are in the labor market, that will uh, create uh, even wor worse uh, problems and so on. But I think this is a, a, a real lesson that the sooner and the more rapidly you integrate people in the labor market, you give them the chance to work. This is a factor of integration, this is a factor of participation, this, uh, by the way, is a good opportunity, as you said. And I heard, by the way, also uh, recently, I, I was with a Jordan uh, labor minister, and he said, well, the Syrian uh, uh, refugees to Jordan, they are all businessmen or businesswomen. They are e extremely, and you mentioned uh, Syria, uh, Jordan, they have created a lot of uh, jobs and opportunities. So I think this is something we, we, we should now really uh, a lesson we should have learned. Now, will this prevail if we are facing, hopefully not, but you cannot exclude it, other uh, migration crisis? Very difficult to say. Very, I, I'm honest, I cannot say yes, this will uh, change, because we have seen, by the way, that countries were very much opposed to migration uh, during the, the, the migration crisis in 2015, are now on the forefront, and they, they have been very active. Poland is one example, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Romania, they are very active and doing a tremendous good job. But we've also That's seen, a good, good point. We've also seen double standards where certain refugees are treated one way by Poland and others yeah, are treated this is, the uh, this is a, a sad issue, a, 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 something which uh, one cannot agree with because we have seen the first day uh, when people crossed or wanted to cross the borders that uh, discrimination were applied. I, th I hope that we, we, we immediately reacted against that and that uh, things had, had changed, but this is an issue and, and, and shows that, well, uh, this conflict is a very particular conflict. It's a European conflict. Let's say the truth. Let's say the truth. It's a European conflict at our borders, and especially at the borders of those countries uh, who uh, were the most reluctant before. So. Uh, that's why I cannot say, no, this would change now the whole migration policy in Europe. By the way, uh, what uh, my colleague has said, yes, we are in a process of negotiating uh, a, a migration policy, more uh, comprehensive, active, 
and also, in a way, harmonized migration policy. The Commission has made a, a very uh, a, a whole uh, bunch of, of proposals, and negotiations are really uh, progressing very, very slowly. So hopefully, we had this instrument of the temporary protection directive, which helped us finally to, to respond in a very, very positive and very uh, active way to, to, to this crisis. Mm. What about on the private sector side? Have you seen a shift now because of Ukraine in mm. terms of the appetite of companies to kind mm. of follow your lead? Mm. Yes, we'll start. You, you were going to say something. <laughs> right. okay. I will try to exercise patience. <laughs> so, I mean, I just want to say something. I'm, I'm so happy to see the awareness. I mean, Turkey has been dealing with this issue for the past decade. We provided housing, we provided jobs, health services, and the, they are integrated in the society now, the Syrian refugees. And some of them are already recruited by European Union, but the qualified ones. So actually what's left in Turkey is mostly the unskilled ones. So this puts us in a position that we have to reskill them and we have to find jobs to them, integrate into the um, labor market. I mean, af but after the, uh, uh, the situation in Ukraine, I think nothing will be the same. I mean, we have to, as the private sector, we have to think differently, act differently, and we have to be more community focused. I mean, for the past two years, we've been talking about ESG, how we can make our businesses or planet better. But now we have to, I think, think differently, be more community focused. We have to integrate these people in our companies because there's like 80 million displaced people in the world. I mean, it's not only Ukrainians, Syrians, but more people, maybe more people will come. So we have to be more creative and probably do work on solutions from the policy level with the governments, with the academia, with the private sector, but we have to work together. I mean, we should not compete anymore. We have to work together and use this diversity to put extra talents in our companies. And the other thing is we have to communicate it very well. Right now in Turkey, of course, we have economical issues. We have 11 percent. Uh, unemployment rate, 21% in the young, young unemployment, so it's not easy for us. But then we have to be probably more long-term focused. And, you know, the, from the private sector, we have to put our hands under the stone, a Turkish saying, and, you know, take it from there. No, I, I, I would just like to agree. I think it is probably so when you listen to experts that it's going to be uh, forever that you would your level of caring will be uh, higher when it's somebody close to you. But I think still there is an opportunity to change the narrative right now. At least it's worth giving a try. So we will, uh, we will ourselves uh, engage now. We are announcing today, actually, that we will uh, launch the toolkit that we have developed the last years, where we are then, uh, long before the Ukrainian uh, war, uh, developing a methodology for how we actually uh, overcome some of the barriers and include... Uh, uh, people that has uh, fleed their homes uh, into our workforce. Um, so it's called Skills for Employment. It's a seven-step model. And we're launching it today to present it in the open. But even more important, I think, we're, we're challenging and inviting 500 companies to join us, to talk about this, and to, to uh, if they can learn from uh, what we have experienced, um, to actually be part of how we turn this into both a humanitarian and economic uh, success story of the future. And you're calling them to join you on what exactly? So we, we, uh, we, we want them to, uh, to, to join the movement, uh, but uh, we also want to uh, have a race up till uh, December 23, when there will be a, a big event around uh, refugees. And so we see that as a milestone. Uh, some of this work will, is not done in a day, so you need to put the program in place. But what we feel and what we experience is that it is not only the right thing to do, but it has all the economic upsides as well. So we're going to invite people. We're going to use the uh, International Refugee uh, Day, I think it is the 20th of June, to actually uh, create a dialogue, but in particular invite other corporates to be part of it. Can I build on that? Because um, uh, I think we see much more interest than in the past from the private sector. And it has a lot to do with um, the aftermath of the pandemic. I, I, I want to be provocative here because what private sector has realized is that we need to give meaning to what we do. Yes. And all our stakeholders are asking us, private sector, to stand for our values to mm. exactly. and to take a stance. In the past, we were getting away with just a, a moment of uh, you know, contrition and uh, poor guys, etc. But now, 
if you want to retain your employees, they need to know that you're true and authentic to your values. Mm. Our motto in the ADECO group is make the future work for everyone. We can't let the refugee on the side of the road. So it's, mm -hmm. it's core of our mission. And when we call for um, our customers, and I did some of this, of this, I did a lot of these call downs to get uh, companies to participate on the platform Jobs for Ukraine. People were jumping in. Mm. And the other thing that was interesting is, um, by the way, it's not only the employees, clients are also asking you, what are you doing? Where are you on the spectrum of support? Mm. Your investors are asking you because ESG being so big. And, and I think when I, when I, when I saw the, um, the movement towards, yes, we want to participate, the other thing that was very telling is that today you have people who are dedicated. Guess who, are call, who I was calling? It was not the CEO. The CEO was saying, talk to my sustainability officer. This person is responsible to make sure that we have our social impact. So what we see, and it's not ideal, I, I'm, I don't want to paint a rosy picture, et cetera. There is still a lot of uh, good intent and not enough action. But what I see is that it, the, the social impact is became, becoming more and more into the fabric of, of the private sector, and we have to participate. It can't be mm. something on the side. Which is new, because as you were telling me earlier, Jesper, you know, you've been lonely <laughs> out there doing this kind of work. <laughs> since 2015, you haven't seen many of your peers in this space. I would say, I, I would say to, to the commissioner's point also that the closer you come to, to, the, to the war and to the conflict, it's more of a grassroots movement and everybody, small companies, big, everybody's engaged. But I would say, the, as I've been traveling to the markets uh, in IKEA surrounding um, or neighboring to Ukraine, um, I've been told by UNHCR, Red Cross, uh, Médecins Sans Frontiers, etc., that uh, they have not met anybody in my position traveling uh, around this topic, so to say. And I, so I think there is still something what you say that people are in general distancing themselves to this topic. But it's part of our reality, it's part of our uh, society, and also so is the opportunity. So therefore I think I'm, I'm happy to, to share that insight uh, with other fellow corporate leaders. Just a word on, on the previous crisis. There has been a study made in Germany because Germany received more than a million, a, a million and a half of refugees during 2015 and, and 16. And there has been a study on, on, on the impact, uh, economic impact. And this study shows ab absolutely that the economic impact is, is positive. So I think uh, we have also to work very, very uh, mm. strongly on the narrative mm -hmm. of immigration. And I think we, we have to be prepared. Well, the demographic evolution uh, in Europe is what it is. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we have to work on this, uh, on this narrative. Now we launched the idea of talents. Uh, indeed, <laughs> Europe now says, well, we, 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 we should try to attract more talents. Uh, that's true uh, because other parts in the world, they attract the talents. I think here yeah, Europe has to be more attractive. Uh, and uh, I think we have to work in our societies on this uh, on these issues but you know uh, immigration is not a one-way street it's not just the immigrant has to do everything but also the society has to give the opportunities to integrate it's a, a two-way street and i think here efforts have to be made housing is important fundamental jobs education uh, and uh, and and uh, and also the possibilities really to be part of the society and there the community approach which you mentioned seems to me extremely important mm. and i do wonder if by showing that the economic benefits uh, making that case putting it into practice that that helps detoxify as as your mm. colleague said the other day the the more kind of social or demographic piece in in Europe in particular that has been such a, a blockage mm. so there may be a way in which that narrative kind of helps what you're doing helps play into that narrative mm. I want to open it up to the floor if there are any questions and if you could briefly introduce yourselves yes I'm uh, Guido van Ham from the University of Antwerp. I'm a virologist, so I'm not related. But I also, in my spare time... If I you could just put the mic a little bit closer. Yeah, uh, I'm Guido van Ham from the University of Antwerp. And in my spare time, I take care of some refugee issues in Belgium. And um, <coughs> so I'm surprised that um, the elephant in the room has not been talked about, which is racism and Islamophobia, which is terrible and which is especially terrible in Eastern Europe. 
So how are we going to address racism and Islamophobia? Thank you. And maybe we'll take one more and then come back to the panel. Hi, I'm uh, Sapta from uh, Tata Consultancy Services. I manage European operations. My question is around, uh, there are a lot of people coming in uh, to Europe from Ukraine seeking jobs. It, it sh we should have a platform by which we are look a lot of people are looking to employ them. Is there a platform that is created which is common, uh, which the commission can create, where these you can publish those jobs and we can kind of take these people in. Otherwise, every enterprise trying to go and these people coming into various platforms like LinkedIn and others is too complicated. And that would probably speed up this whole uh, you know, employment aspect. And the second one I had was on skills because uh, we need to develop skills at scale and what are the solutions for that? Are there programs that are coordinated by the commission that can help us all join together? The good news is that you don't have to build it, ADECO already has. <laughs> so we have already a platform, it's job for ukraine uh, I can send you the details uh, right after. Um, this was put in place like two weeks after uh, the invasion, and so we already have over 1,500 companies participating from any sectors, um, and it's, it's totally free, it's totally pro bono. Um, and so we are working with the NGO to make sure that uh, refugees get access to the platform. We are also providing coaching for them to develop their resume, to do assessment on their skills. And we also have over, uh, I think it's uh, over 6,000 refugees who are benefiting from a wide range of uh, programs for training. Uh, we have partnership with Berlitz uh, on, uh, on language. We have partnership with Cisco, Microsoft, etc. the big tech industry for technical skills. So we are actually calling on for partners. Come and join us, you know. Um, as I was saying, it's, it's not uh, the ADECO group doing everything by itself. It's the coalition of the willing. It's everyone participating to their core. Um, and so if, if uh, in your company you have curriculum that you could put on the platform, please come because this will accelerate the access to market for all these refugees. I'm, I'm not ignoring the Islamophobia question. I'm going to come back to it. But Ebru, do you want to speak to the skills issue? How do you address that challenge? Uh, this is what we are doing right now, trying to put down programs together with the academia and the language schools as well, and especially this, the lady who is the entrepreneur who has opened the language school. Uh, because if without language, it's very hard for them to survive in Turkey. I'm talking about the Syrians. By the way, we have Ukrainians too, but um, mm -hmm. you know they're more integrated. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the Syrians, we they are very much in, currently in this textile sector, but we really want them to be technically involved as well. I work with one petroleum engineer, a woman, and it was so hard for her to uh, make her diploma valid. Yeah. You know, it took ages for her. I experienced day by day with her to send it to Aleppo from the university. So these are the things right now we are working on the engineering level. But the skilling, thanks to digitalization with universities, language school, we are putting down its program together. Mm. Maybe a short, short remark. And also, I will uh, uh, enjoy studying how you operate. And But also, we, this is not a competition. So we're also glad to share the, the learnings because... Um, as we are launching our methodology today, it's about the nitty gritties in the how uh, to overcome the barriers. And then I would just like to comment, uh, even if I'm sure that the commissioner would love to comment on the first uh, uh, question here. I'm not sure he will love to comment <laughs> on the first question. But I, I think from, from our perspective, it's a very, uh, not to allow elephants to, to be invisible in the room. I think it's a very valid uh, question that is not only, of course, a political uh, ownership. We all have to take ownership for that question. It's a scary uh, and complex question. And I, I don't, uh, I would not pretend to have the answer to your question. But I believe uh, today and th these th days I've experienced in Davos, people discuss on top of the challenges, interesting enough, I hear talent and I hear polarization. And racism is probably the ugliest uh, uh, part of polarization. But I think by what we are discussing here, by bringing people together, to not isolating people in our societies and making sure people get to know each other, work together. At least I think that holds a, a small part of the puzzle in how we can avoid that. So thank you. But practically within IKEA, did you face resistance because of some of that racism or Islamophobia when of you course, tried to integrate refugees? Of course we did, but I would say not. it's uh, al almost, uh, it's, so, it's not been one of the topics we had to discuss. I thought it would be. 
it's there in society, but since we're a company that are for many people, and that we, since ages, have been representing people and basically having an inclusive attitude to gender, uh, where you come from, what's your sexual preference, whatever, I think people are not, people are more curious and driven by that force. And I think it was one of the recommendations that came out of um, the white paper that also setting a tone from the top becomes very important. Mm. It's such a cultural issue that that can perhaps be part of the answer that when CEOs send a certain message within their companies that you get a bit more traction. Mm. But Commissioner, more broadly <laughs> within Europe, what can be done to overcome the Islamophobia that is at the heart of so much of the anti-refugee sentiment? Well, first, I want to say that certainly uh, the uh, more Eastern European, Central European countries. The problem was, well, we do not want uh, people uh, of a different religion. That was very clearly the message we got. Now, I would not say racism is just in Central and, Euro and, 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 and Eastern Europe. Racism is everywhere, in all our societies. And uh, we know that uh, populism is growing with racism and Islamophobia. And uh, when we look at the election in recently in some countries, how these themes have been at the center for some parties, this is quite, mm. uh, quite uh, worrisome. Mm. So I think we have really to work on that uh, and also work on, on the solutions because we failed in many respects on, on, on really uh, uh, getting the right integration solutions. When you put all the people in some poor area and they have no job, and then uh, the problems come up of racism and, 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 and all kinds of difficulties in some area or, uh, or suburbs in big cities, well, these are the, the errors we committed during the past and which have to be absolutely corrected. But certainly, we, we cannot accept any, any, um, any racism or discrimination. But this is a, a, a difficult fight we have really to fight. But uh, certainly, on, in Eastern Europe, in Central Europe, these are society. We have also to understand these societies. They are uh, they they were closed societies, largely closed. So uh, this was a shock for them, and it was abused by some political leaders. We all know that who started to rebuild fences around the, their country. We, they, the, um, the first country where fences were demolished where the, was the country where a fence was again uh, uh, built. So this is also a policy and, and, and populist uh, uh, policies which, uh, which we have to fight. So this on, on, on racism, this is, by the way, a, a major topic in the European Union, I think, non-discrimination, fighting all kinds of inequalities and discriminations. This is high on our agenda. And I can tell you that I think across many sectors beyond um, government and, and corporate, even within uh, my world, the humanitarian sector, a lot of agencies are looking to say, how can we leverage this moment of Ukraine to um, kind of tap into a broader solidarity? And that the, you know, there's a lot of energy going into thinking about how can you translate that into broader support for other refugees? Whether that works or not is, a, is an open question. We've got a minute and 45 seconds left. So maybe just to close, if I can hear from each of you, if there's one kind of practical tip for uh, folks who are interested in um, moving forward in this direction, who uh, are facing some of these barriers, who um, you know, are, are looking for advice, what's one way forward um, that you can propose to them? And maybe, Jesper, since you're launching the toolkit, we can start with you. No, but I, I would, uh, two things, uh, I, I wrote here, winter is coming, but I re re realized I was uh, already taken. Uh, you wrote what? Uh, winter is coming. Winter I think, you know, coming. we need to brace ourselves. Uh, uh, there are several uh, f uh, things going on in the world right now that are scary. Um, we stand before a famine crisis, we stand before uh, climate change that will, will put enormous pressure on this topic. Yeah. And again, the, the war is ongoing in, in Ukraine, and uh, as much as um, things, um, there are some optimism in it. Uh, you know, we have a winter ahead of us that's going to be energy crisis and uh, more of refugees uh, more likely. So on one hand, I think we need to brace ourselves and make ourselves mm -hmm. ready um, uh, for, for the coming period. Secondly, I would just say that let's continue to do what I think the forum does so excellently and others. Let's bring this topic into the public. Let's talk about it. Let's have a dialogue and let's make sure that there is a space 
where companies have a responsibility, a bigger responsibility to actually be a part of the solution. Thank you. Valeri. Well, I would say uh, for corporate, for private sector, focus on where you're good at. Don't try to invent yourself an NGO if you are not. Work with the people who know. Don't try to think that you come to the solution by yourself. Are you sure you know what the Ukrainian people want? All these women who are refugees, so work with the people who have access so that you get their needs. Um, and work with the public institution as well. It will take a village to make that happen. So that would be my conclusion. Commissioner? Well, I think we, we have to keep the momentum of solidarity in our societies because there's one danger which we should not totally exclude. That's the danger of some kind of fatigue at the end. Mm. So I think we have a, a huge responsibility in supporting, in finding very concrete solutions. And I think what the private sector is doing is, is of essence, it's, it's key. Uh, because we, we have, housing is key because, well, people are ready to receive somebody for one month, two months, three months. And then maybe they start to say, well, where's the solution? So there is for the public sector a big responsibility to work on also on that side on solutions uh, to, to finally uh, when uh, to take over the solidarity which has been so strong on, 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 on the citizens or, or civil society side. So I think this is something we have to, to plan ahead, to see ahead, because unfortunately this war will go on and this is, a, this is terrible. Mm. And I wonder if actually private sector engagement might push some of the more reluctant governments to also um, pick up their socks. Ebru, last word. And uh, for refugees, be, I mean, you're already courageous. You know, you have done a lot. So continue to be resilient. Ask for help. Asking for help is not bad. But also show us the pro to the private sector, to the government, show us ways to help you. Because, you know, the programs, it's like we, we come up with after direct communication. So it's very good to ask for help. It's nothing bad. And plus, show, showing us ways how you can be benefit to us and be benefit to you. For private sector, nothing will be the same. I mean, you know, world has changed. We have to act differently. Uh, we have to do everything what we have done so far differently. As Valerie said, values are important. I mean, now we have 50,000 people. Our value is that we exist if we deliver and we exist if we collaborate. And we have to collaborate maybe with you, with, with the others. But all of us has to join forces, not only the real, real sector, but with the governments. I mean, you know, with the European Commission, understanding the rest of the world as well. And but yeah. it's good to see that. I mean, yeah. now there's bigger solidarity. And I'm happy to see that. So I've heard that uh, there are a number of barriers to being able to integrate refugees, but that they are surmountable when there is an appetite, and that that appetite is beginning to grow, uh, and that we may be at a turning point now, not only because of Ukraine, but as you say, Valeri, because of the pressure that um, employees and others are putting on companies to be better global citizens. Um, and I think you've also heard a number of practical tools that you can use um, from ADECO's platform to IKEA's toolkit, um, for uh, the EU, this directive that could perhaps be applied to other refugees. Um, and so I hope you're uh, walking away from this with a few tangible things that you can take forward. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.